My name is Kevin, and this whole mess started a few months before quarantine last year. I was in 8th grade and my sister Jessica was in 7th grade. This particular day, as we got off the bus to go home, we noticed this white busted van just sitting near the edge of the road. This was odd as we hadn't ever seen the vehicle before. Inside was an older man, just minding his business, or so I thought. We barely noticed him at first, but not long after seeing the van, I felt like something was wrong. It was as if someone was watching us. I noticed Jessica's gaze shift to the vehicle, and I followed. The man was staring at Jessica. He had this crazy look in his eyes, then proceeded to lick his lips in a really odd manner. The stranger got out of his van and started limping towards us. He reminded me of a zombie the way he dragged his leg, his torn and dirty clothes, the slight moan that emerged from his throat. That freaked us out, so we decided to sprint home. As soon as we got inside, we locked the door. We looked at each other and thought the same thing. What in the world was he doing? I decided to get my mind off of him, thinking he was just some crazy old man. Since he'd reminded me of a zombie, I pulled out my phone to play The Walking Dead Survivors. It's a game based on The Walking Dead TV show, where you can experience the original story in a post-apocalyptic world with more than 80 iconic characters that include Rick, Glenn, Michonne, Negan, and many more. It features a tower defense system gameplay where you have to strategize with limited resources and defend your base with traps, routes, and structures while fighting hordes of walkers. Explore the unknown, fight with walkers, encounter classic characters from the comics, build a camp, form a strategy, and even establish a clan. Are you playing that game again? Jessica asked. Can I play with you? Of course. Soon enough, we were both online in a clan, recruiting new survivors, gathering supplies, gaining territories, and kicking zombies' butt. Only in this game, they're called walkers. My camp was under constant siege from the undead creatures. Once Jessica joined my clan, though, we started taking over more territories and building up strongholds as we went. Since each of the survivors we could recruit had unique skills and abilities, my sister and I were able to distract ourselves by figuring out which task was best for each character based on their attributes. Some we'd send for supplies, others we'd set exploring, or farming, or training, while the rest could be used to fight off walkers. If they got hurt, we could even take care of their medical needs. Always remember, your survival depends on your strategy. If you want to see if you can survive the Walking Dead survivors, play now for free by clicking the link in the video description and use the code TWD Survivors to get free in game rewards worth $20. I eventually forgot about the strange, dirty man, but when we returned from school the next day, the creepy van was still there, and so was the stranger. He was staring at us, and he did the same thing, licking his lips in the oddest manner. We ran home, and I closed the door and checked all the locks again. Jessica and I both agreed to not tell our parents, because we didn't want them to worry sick, knowing the kind of paranoid people they are. This kept going on for about a week, him being there and us getting scared and running home whenever we passed his van. But then it just stopped. He wasn't there anymore. We both felt relieved. As we got home, Jessica and I immediately logged into the Walking Dead survivors again. After an hour, we both heard a knock on our door. This was unusual, as we didn't get visitors that often. Startled, I went to check who it was. I peeked out the window next to the door. It was this tall guy, about 6'3", wearing a black hoodie pulled high to also cover his face. In his hands was a pizza box. A pizza box? Who wouldn't want free pizza, I thought to myself. I looked over to Jessica, who also noticed him. She shook her head no. Don't you want free pizza? I asked. We don't even know who that is. Or what's in the box? Please don't open the door, said Jessica. She made a good point. The delivery guy knocked again, much harder this time. Can you open up? He asked. We didn't order any pizza, I responded. He didn't say anything for a moment. It's from your parents, the man said. They wanted to surprise you, so can you open the door? I looked at Jessica. She was pale her eyes narrow. He's lying, she whispered. Mom and Dad would have told us if they were sending pizza. They wouldn't want us to open the door for a stranger. The delivery guy knocked again, so hard this time that the door shook. Stop playing around, he growled. 
Open. Now. I didn't say anything this time, but I did lock the deadbolt. The man must have heard because he began pounding on the door. After a few moments, he stepped back. I glanced out of the peephole, just in time to see him take off his hood, revealing his face. Oh no, I muttered. It was the same guy that was stalking us after school for the past week. He noticed me staring and licked his lips in that horrifying manner. I looked at Jessica. She had the same terrified expression as me. Call the police and hide in the upstairs bathroom, I screamed. She ran upstairs as I went to check if the back door was locked. After I confirmed that the entire house was secure, I went upstairs and hid in the bathroom with Jessica. I found her shaking and crying in the bathtub. I told her everything was okay, even though I knew we were in danger. Just as I was finally calming her down, we heard glass shatter. He was inside the house. We stayed there, not daring to move a muscle. I could hear his heavy, dragging footsteps around the house. Kevin, Jessica, I know you guys are here. Please don't make this hard for me. His groaning voice echoed around the house, filling every corner. The stranger was starting to make his way up the stairs. Jessica began hyperventilating. I got in the tub and covered her mouth so her breathing wouldn't give our location away. The old man was yelling, laughing like a maniac just on the other side of the door. Jessica's eyes were white with panic. Don't worry, we're okay, I whispered to her. Just pretend that we're survivors, like in the game. The zombies can't find the survivors if they're quiet. Jessica still looked terrified, but she nodded and stopped shaking quite so bad. You guys are trapped. You're all mine, the old man moaned. My clothes were drenched in sweat. The stranger approached the bathroom. He was standing in the hall, laughing. Then, suddenly, he became silent. It was so quiet, you could hear a pin drop in the distance. The old man was scraping the other side of the door with something metal. After a few seconds of scratching, he hit the wood hard enough to cause the frame to shake. I peeked over the edge of the tub. The point of a knife was pressing through the door. We were doomed. This was going to be the end. I was processing our last moments. The man slammed into the door again and again, causing the wood to crack. Jessica screamed. A final blow buckled the door and snapped the lock. The old man stood in the doorway and licked his cracked lips. He was even grimier than when we'd seen him in the van. His eyes were bloodshot and had a yellow tint with dark bags hanging under them. The man's skin was scabby and peeling, pale and covered in dirt. His hair was a rat's nest of greasy gray tangles. What few teeth he had left were rotting, black at the gums. He showed them in a crooked smile as he watched us. The man took one step towards us, then froze. A wailing sound filled the room, coming from just outside. Sirens. The police. I never felt more relieved in my life. But just when we thought the man would run away, he continued to step forward, dragging his feet. Mumbling inaudibly, with the knife held forward as if he was hungry for blood. My sister screamed at the top of her lungs, and at that moment, a large gunshot went off, almost making my eardrums explode. Platters of meat painted the wall, and the man fell to the floor. Behind him was a police officer. I looked over to Jessica. Her eyes were rolling back. She collapsed. Jessica! I shook her. Jessica! Jessica! No response. The paramedics came quickly and took Jessica to the hospital with me riding along. The trip to the hospital felt like hours. Horrible thoughts raced through my head. Just as we reached the hospital, I saw my parents in the parking lot. I ran to them, hugged them, and broke down weeping. We crowded into the waiting room. After about an hour, the doctors came out revealing that Jessica had just collapsed in shock and that she was perfectly fine. We went into her room and, sure enough, Jessica was all right. I was so thankful that she was alive. About a minute later, the police arrived. They asked our parents to speak in private in the hallway, but the door was open enough that Jessica and I overheard everything they said. They took the pizza box to the crime lab and found out that the food was spiked with cyanide, a deadly poison. Thank God we didn't eat it. The police went on to say that this was the third case of attempted poisonings in town in the last month. All of the events appeared to be linked because the poison used was always cyanide and the targets were always children. 
We don't know what the hell was wrong with that guy. Maybe he was mental. But after that day, Jessica and I never stayed home alone again. Instead, we stayed with our cousins after school. Most people don't even believe me when I tell them, but I have a job where I work from home. People in my area mostly work with cars or in the medical industry. There aren't many jobs where I live. Thankfully, I was able to land a decent paying job that let me work from my home office. It definitely comes with its struggles, but it is hands down the best job opportunity available to me right now. It isn't always perfect. It definitely comes with its pitfalls. Sometimes you have to sit at your computer even when there isn't any work to be done. It's also very easy to get distracted. But I think my biggest problem has to do with the house itself. It's kind of creepy. The house itself is an old Victorian, like really old. We're talking mid-1800s. A family friend owned the house and sold it to me for a very fair price, basically gave it to me. I was super excited because it meant I got a nice big house to live in by myself along with my girlfriend. I'm a natural loner and I don't really care for social interaction, so I had a nice big house all to myself and girlfriend and job where I work from home with very minimal social interaction with other people. That was basically my ideal life. But the house's age meant that it was going to be scary at times. And I don't mean with ghosts or anything like that, but sometimes I hear the house settling in or making noises that I can't explain. I've actually had quite a few instances where I'll be sitting down and doing some work and then out of nowhere, I hear a noise that I just can't rationalize. I go exploring throughout the house only to find that nothing has changed. It's as ominous as it is frustrating. I did just about what anyone else in the world would do. I started to use background noise to drown out the disturbances. First, I tried those quiet instrumentals on YouTube. You know, the ones that last five hours and they're supposed to put you at ease or something. It didn't really work for me because I couldn't get my computer to be loud enough to drown out all the noises. It was also not very good at keeping my attention. There was one week where my work was really slow and there wasn't a whole lot to do. I still had to sit at my computer though. There was an understanding that I was allowed to basically do anything I wanted as long as I was available to my coworkers if something came through that needed to be done. I didn't quite know what to do with this time and just started watching documentaries on YouTube. It was actually pretty fun. I learned a lot. And so that next week when things started picking up again, I just instinctively turned on a documentary. I wouldn't be able to have all of my focus on it, but it was a lot better than having some ambient noise. It actually helped distract me from the sounds of the house. I guess I just didn't have enough mental focused energy to notice any of the other sounds going on around me, if that makes any sense. Well, it had been about two weeks of me watching documentaries while I worked. Everything seemed to be good. Until one Friday morning, I started work at 8 and this must have been around 10, I was sitting at my office chair working while I listened to a documentary about certain conspiracy theories, when all of a sudden... I heard an abrupt banging noise coming from upstairs. Like I had said, I hadn't been distracted by any noises for a while by this point, so the fact that I noticed this noise meant that it was probably serious. My fight or flight kicked in. You might laugh at me, but when I work, I keep a knife next to me. I ran upstairs with the knife and looked around for any suspicious noises. The banging had stopped and I didn't know where it had come from. I knew what section of the house that I heard it from, but there didn't seem to be anything out of place. I stood there for a few moments and then I heard it again. It happened right on the other side of my door. I immediately braced myself for there to be some kind of animal or something trying to get in. I didn't really know what to expect. I opened my door to see that the screen door had not been properly closed. My girlfriend didn't close it all the way when she left for work that morning. It was also pretty windy that day, so it was just going back and forth causing a banging noise when the wind got bad. This was kind of a breaking point for me. I didn't want to live my life in constant paranoia and fear of some kind of attacker coming into my home. We live in a safe area. There's never been a serious threat. And I have run around my house with a knife way too many times now. I honestly felt kind of stupid. So I made a decision. I was no longer going to assume that someone was breaking in if and when I heard a sound. I put the knife in my dresser in my bedroom and decided that I was going to just be in to work while I was working, except for my documentary of course. So there I was the next week. 
It happened on a Wednesday. I was sitting in my office doing exactly what I had set out to do. I was working, ignoring the noises, and listening to a documentary. I remembered the exact part of the documentary I was on when I heard it. The sound was the loudest sound I had heard in the house up to that point. At first, I reassured myself that it was nothing and that I need to fight against this paranoia. The sound continued, and I couldn't take my mind off of it. After about five minutes of listening to what sounded like rummaging and walking, I went upstairs to check. Bear in mind I didn't have any weapon on me and I was expecting some kind of reasonable explanation. When I got to my kitchen I saw that the front door was wide open. The cabinets were all open and there was a strange man rummaging through my stuff. I didn't notice until after the fact but he had been eating something. I remember screaming at him. I don't remember what I said but it was something to the effect of what are you doing in my house, obviously. Then he just ran off. Didn't say a single word. He took a loaf of bread with him, but I don't think he took anything else, other than what I had eaten before I came upstairs. I reasoned with myself that he must have been some sort of homeless man or something. I don't know why else he would steal a loaf of bread from a very ordinary looking house. And this was the worst thing that could have happened. On some instinctual level, it had proved all of my worst fears right. There was some kind of danger in my house, and of course, it was the one time when I didn't have my knife on me. I lucked out that he didn't try to hurt me or anything, but it's still horrifying to see nonetheless. I just work at a local coffee shop now. It's honestly my only way to stay sane. When I was 14, I would spend the summer holidays away from school at home. In the small village I lived in, this meant I mainly spent my days on my own, just watching TV and playing The Sims. My parents were generally out of the house from 8am until 5pm. I was raised to never answer the door to strangers. However, my favourite spot in the living room was right next to the window, so I could always see people on the street, and in turn, they could see me. One day, I was sat watching daytime TV when I noticed a man walking down our street. As our street has a dead end, I normally recognize everyone who walks down it, but I'd certainly never seen this guy before. He was tall, thin, and unshaven. He was wearing a hooded jumper with the hood up and his sleeves rolled up as well, revealing tattoos on his arms. He was carrying a large duffel bag, and was looking closely at each house he passed. As I was sat there watching him, I was clearly in full view. He started to pass our house, and when he saw me, he smiled and started walking up our short drive. He came up to our front door and knocked. I knew I shouldn't answer, but he had seen me. And at 14, I was afraid of being rude to an adult, so I obediently went and opened the door a crack. I peeked around the door and said hello. As he spoke, he pulled the duffel bag around to the front of his body and asked me if my parents were home. At this point, I figured he'd probably leave if I said no, but instead, he stepped forward towards the door and unzipped the bag. Well, the thing is, I just got out of prison. I want to do the right thing, you know? It's so hard to find a job, so I'm trying to sell some things. He started pulling towels, handkerchiefs, and other junk out of his bag. The word prison made my heart skip a beat, and I quickly mumbled something about having no money, and I closed the door on him. He stood outside my door for a minute still talking to me about being able to help. So I went upstairs and waited for him to leave, which he eventually did. I soon settled back down to watching the TV and forgot all about the encounter. At 5pm, my parents came home and they took the TV, so I went up to my room. A little while later, there was a knock at the door. I came onto the landing and peered down as my mum answered. 
two police officers were stood there on the step. They asked if anyone had come by that day. My mum said no one had, and that's when I remembered my visitor from earlier. I came down the stairs and said that actually someone had called by. Seeing as I was young, the two police officers asked to come inside and talk to me. They asked me to describe the man and the conversation I had with him. They seemed really worried and kept telling me not to worry and to be honest about what happened. Once I'd told them everything, they asked to speak to my parents on their own and then they thanked me and left. I was straight on at my parents, asking them what was going on. My mum explained that a few minutes after the guy had come to our house, he had gone to another girl's house. She was in the shower and hadn't answered the door when he knocked. Apparently, he led himself into the house and walked upstairs. When he found her in the shower, he sexually assaulted her. With my description and the evidence from the girl, they tracked the guy down. It turned out he had just been released from prison for a similar attack on another girl. I never answer the door when I'm alone now, and I refuse to shower when I'm home alone.